I have a very special hotel room. I don't know about you, but it's the first time in my life that my hotel room has no window. <laughs> it's, in, it's in the basement, and I'm, I'm sure if there's nuclear fallout, it's safe to stay there. <laughs> uh, and so yesterday I worked a little bit on the presentation, and um, since there are limited resources in such a hotel room, uh, you'll see some kind of MacGyver-type slides. <laughs> um, and you don't, won't see many more slides of these. So we're talking about the AST and uh, tokenization. And basically, I have talked about that last year in Amsterdam too. So if you have listened to that talk last year, there's nothing fundamentally new that I'm going to show you, but I'm showing you new ways of doing things. Uh, who of you have, has worked with AST and tokenization? Okay, it's about half. Um, the thing is, it's, it's an old thing. It's in PowerShell for quite some time now. And uh, I remember the tech in Berlin. That was when we had PowerShell 2, so it's a long time ago, when Jeffrey took all the MVPs to a secret side room and showed off PowerShell 3 and introduced the access to the AST, whatever that is. I'll explain it to you in a second. Um, and, and he said, that's, gonna, that's going to be the foundation for lots of clever tools. And I'm sure after this talk, you can create lots of these tools yourself. So let's get back to my <coughs> PowerPoint for Geeks that you know from yesterday. And uh, yeah, let's start with the intro. Tokenization in AST is a little bit like black and white TV versus color TV. So when you look at the IC, oh, someone must have <laughs> okay permanent marker. Um, so when you look at the AST code, you see color colorization, and that is basically a second channel of information. So if you start with PowerShell, or if you are an expert in PowerShell, it's always a good idea to look at the colors because they explain to you exactly what PowerShell thinks your code is. Um, before I go on, um, I brought to you uh, just a little presentation video. Let's see if I can turn it on. I need to turn it on here. Uh, from yesterday, just to celebrate all the, all the places that we have visited here. Let's see if that works. Yeah, I think it should. So I hope you remember. So if you're falling asleep, that's okay. I know why. Did you all go to the ice farm? Okay. Okay. And the same kind of slides you'll see in a second. <coughs> because now the question is, how does IZ know about these tokens? And that is exactly the first interface. IZ or PowerShell <laughs> receives your script as a stream of characters. It's just unstructured character stream. So the first thing PowerShell does is it feeds the stream of characters into its parser, and the parser has the job to combine characters to meaningful entities, to these tokens. These are the tokens. And basically, you can even see the tokenization in action when you run this run code like 1MB, you know what you get, you get one megabyte. And when you are a beginner and you write it like that, you first of all, you see a squiggle line that tells you what's wrong. But then when you run it, the error message would also say unexpected token. So it did tokenize these things. You see colors, that's the first part, tokenization. But then there is someone else who's important, and I'm talking about that second thing too, that's the abstract syntax tree, the AST. And the AST is basically telling you the context of those tokens. And the AST told PowerShell here, yeah, well, there are two tokens, but I don't know what this token, which is the blue, so it's a command, what this command should really do after the one. So that doesn't make sense. So you can either look at the individual tokens, which we'll do in a second, or you can look at the abstract syntax tree to get a, a more a, a wider impression of what that expression will do. Okay, so let's first take a look at how you get two tokens. And uh, there's like a two part of this presentation. The first presentation, we're simply consuming the information that PowerShell gives to you. And I'm consuming this by, create, I've created three functions for you. Get token and get token old. And telling you the difference in a second, get AST and get error. <coughs> in the second part, I'm looking into these functions and, and show you how they are created. But basically, when you work with tokens in AST, you don't want to mess with the low-level interfaces all the time. You want to get results. So here you see get token old, kind command, and I want that to be piped to the grid view. <coughs> so I'm, I'm actually, I'm asking the tokenizer for this script, give me all the commands that you have in the script. And if I run this, you can see what happens. I have two commands in my script, get token old and out grid view, 
And it's giving me all the information where the tokens can be found, which line, which column, which position. So it's basically like a search for things in your, <coughs> in your script. This thing is called get token old because, it's, because it is using the old tokenizer interface that was in PowerShell 2 already. So this is a very, really simple interface. When you look at this, get token old kind, then this list here with the kinds represents the token kinds that ISE would colorize for you. It's not very detailed, but it's basically what you see here and what you also see when you go to uh, options and uh, look at the script pane tokens. These are the tokens that the function exposes to you and these are the, the token types that you can colorize in ISE. So let's assume um, I have a different task. Let's say I have a function and I need to, or let's just play uh, a situation where you have a script with a couple of functions, A, B, C, D. So I now have two functions. Let's assume that was a script, thousand lines with lots of functions. And you just want to know what the function names are in your script. You could try this and see what happens. If I look for the right token type, I could see what I get. I don't get a command. So let's see what, what else I, can I get. If I don't find the right token, I simply don't specify a kind. And then I get all the tokens. And now you can see there is, there the, are the token types. There are a couple of tokens, new line tokens, and this is a keyword token, the function. So the test one, the name of my function, seems to be a command argument for some reason. But now you can see, this is a command argument, this one too. So once I know the token type, I could say kind command argument. And I get back A, B, C, D and test one, which is the content of the token. So if I got this and use PowerShell 3 automatic unrolling content, wait, oh, presentation mode. <coughs> content, then this would be the list of my functions. This wouldn't work in a real world script because when you look at the tokens alone, this is a command argument. You can find <coughs> command arguments in many places in your script. So um, if there was a, an actual call of a function, it might have also command arguments. You're simply referring to the colorization. So that's not really detailed. Let's go one step further. Um, here is a function, it's called get token, not get token old. This one is accessing the new interface introduced in PowerShell 3, which is much more detailed. That was the reason why in PowerShell 2, when you had code like this, hello name, why in PowerShell 2, this whole string would be brown, because the uh, PowerShell 2 tokenizer has only limited capabilities, whereas the modern tokenizer detects that there is a variable inside of the stri string, that this variable is a variable, so it is red, this is brown. So the new interface will actually differentiate these things and give you very granular control over what you can do. So let's see what's going on here. Get token. With get token, I again have kind, but now you see the list is much more detailed. You can look for anything, for operator types, for whatever you are looking for. And um, so if I was looking for command type, I wouldn't find it here. I find command, but that doesn't give me anything. Because the new tokenizer has two things that you can use to find tokens. You have the token kind and you have a token flag. And the token flag is differentiating the different tokens within a certain kind. And here I can sort for command name, and this gives me immediately the command names in my script. So again, if I wanted to have just the value, I could say get token flag command name, and uh, then please give me the value of all of it. And since this is supported in PowerShell 3 and above, you can safely use automatic enrolling because you can't run this on PowerShell 2 anyway. So if I run this now, here are my commands. I have one get token, one output view, and one get token. 
Now that will be the first step and depending on what you want to do, it really depends on how much time you have at your hands because this is just an enabling technique. It simply, um, it, it simply gives you that information. You can have low hanging fruits when you want to document your script, you just want a list of variables that you use or something that's done in a couple of seconds. Or you can bang your head to the wall for months when you're trying to come up with a great pretty printer for PowerShell. That can be very, very challenging. The important part at this point is get token old is really simply using and get token is using the tokenizer. And I prepared a slide like this MacGyver slide. Uh, let's see if that works. With the limited resources in the hotel room, uh, I didn't have any real paper. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yesterday night after two beers, thanks, um, I wasn't feeling like doing a sophisticated slide anymore. And that's interesting. It's, it's a water bottle and you can just place your iPhone on top of it and then record this. And well, I like that type of presentation. And so, so you see the stream of characters that really, by the tokenizer, uh, put into different entities, two different entities. These are the two tokens. And if I turn on the sound, you'd, you'd also hear Pirates of the Caribbean, because that was a Swedish TV. <laughs> okay, these are the tokens now, and um, that's what we used. You simply say, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, sim you, you simply say, what kind of token do I want, and then I can do things with it. Now let's go one step further and go to the abstract syntax tree. The abstract syntax tree is the entity that tells you that this whole thing is a pipeline, for example. And you can see with IC Sterrets that it is actually using that. You see this, this border around this, that is the pipeline border. So it's taking that information from, from AST and other tools can do the same thing. Um, so how does the AST work? Okay, I'll just turn these things off. There is a command called get AST. Again, I'll show you the source code in, in a second. And you can ask what kind of AST structure you would like to see. So in this case, I am asking AST to show me all the commands. Let's see what I get. Okay, now what you get here is the command elements that it found. These are always complete commands, including the parameters and anything that is required for this command. So the logical units. Um, it gives you an extend. So if you would drill into the extend, it's simply a property that when you open it, gives you all the positions from line to column, starting and ending from line to column. So you can identi identify where that AST structure starts and ends. And this looks kind of abstract, but now let's check out how we can, for example, get an inventory of, uh, like a good inventory of a script with all the function names in it. When you look at the tokens, it's not good because again, there, there are many overlaps. With AST, it's fairly simple. This, for example, down here, would get me all the parameters in all my functions. That's just the first step. Yesterday we had a talk, someone said he has workflows and he needs to find out the parameters of those workflows to feed them into some other system. This would be a way of doing this. Okay, that's not a workflow, but it's a function. No, same thing. So I have uh, one function with two parameters, I have another function with two parameters, and now I am outputting parameters. Okay, let's do that. Get AST, AST type parameter. No, parameter. And this is what, what you get. You get a bunch of objects. And in fact, we have four parameters in those functions. I get back eight objects when I look at it. And that is because parameters are this, and also this, and also this. These are all parameters. For the AST, it's always the same thing. So I would get them in, in, in certain locations. What you can now do is dive into that tree. This one here, for example, get AST, would give me the function definition. So this gets me the whole block of a function inside of my script. And then it takes me just a where object to say which function I want. It get, gets me all the functions. I want to explore, test something new. So when I do this, I get just this part and test something new. Let's do that. Run this. Uh, okay. Function. So this is just one object 
containing all the information, uh, that's apparent, that's the function I picked. This is information about it, is it a filter, is it a function, is it a workflow, I can check all of these things out. And once I have this, <coughs> I can use it as a parent to another call to get AST. So now I say get AST, please give me the parameter block of that function only. So don't give me all the parameter blocks in my entire script, but I just want the parameter block of that function. So I'll do that. Let's take a look at the parameter block. Parameter block. And here you see, here are my parameters, test one and test two. So now I want the actual parameters in that parameter block for my documentation. So I get my, um, I get parameters from that parameter block and then I'm simply diving into the properties. So if I run this, you'll see I get two objects, test one, test two, and then with automatic unrolling, I'm simply saying, please give me just the names of those, test one, test two. So if I wanted to automate that process, it's really all there. If um, you can make a function out of this by itself. So if I wanted to explore, not test something new, but test something, all I needed to do is pick another function. And now the whole thing would return the other parameters. So the AST is really an interesting thing to explore the structure of your scripts. Um, and it is putting the tokens into perspective. So in case you want to refresh that, here's another little um, presentation. So this is where we started. And basically the AST is then combining meaningful tokens to an expression. In this case, the AST would detect that that is a command expression. And with get AST, you can ask for all these uh, expressions that you have. And when you dive into that command expression that AST delivers to you, in the sub-properties of that object, you find all the details. For example, this would be index 0, index 1, into the command It's, it's kind of hard. <laughs> into the command elements. Element zero is always the command itself, and then the other elements would be whatever you submitted to that command. Just to, sh to see that same thing here in, in, uh, in code, if I take a command like that, let's take this script here. So if I really do take this command that I just had on the slide, and then I'm looking for command expressions like that, AST will immediately return to me exactly that. This is a command expression. It has command elements. And the command elements I can take a look at. Command element 0 would be the command itself. Get process here. And the next thing would be the parameter to that command and then the argument and so forth. So you have three different uh, functions now here, get token old, get token and get AST. And then there's a fourth function that I'd like to give to you, which is um, get error. Get errors or syntax errors is always something that you can encounter and it is again something that the parser produces. Syntax errors in contrast to runtime errors are something that they occur before even the script starts to run because it's the parser who says, I don't understand that structure. So get error, here's a function that doesn't work, right? So if I now say get error, it'll give me all the syntax problems in that script. It's basically the same thing that you saw with the red squiggle lines. And the interesting part about this is you not only get the position of the syntax errors, but also, in this case, for example, you have follow-up errors. There can only be one syntax error that is relevant, like IC steroids would, would show that with the warning sign. The warning sign isn't up here, it's not down here, it's right here, because that is the primary error. And um, add a comma, it says. Okay, so let's add a comma. Add a comma. And now the syntax error is gone. So most of the syntax errors were follow-up errors based on the first error. So get error tells you what the first error is. It's always the first error reported by get error. 
Now let's take a look at how these functions work and from the inside. <coughs> let's first take a look at get token old. And um, when you look at that thing, it's not that large. Let's make the code a little bit smaller so it looks smaller. So basically, um, this function is simply taking one parameter, and that's the kind of token you want to, want to get. And it's taking the available kinds from this type, PS token type. PS token type, this type, when you copy that, will show you exactly the token types that you have available. There they are. So these are the token types that the old interface understands. Now this function is miraculously taking the text from the current ISE window. You could change that function so that it uh, accepts pipeline input or whatever you want. In this case, I'm simply taking the current code from the current editor window in ISE. And now this is the, the, the important part. Here is the old parser. It's called PS parser. It has one static method called tokenize. And tokenize is kind of weird to call because you not only submit the code, but you also need to uh, submit an empty variable that will be filled by reference. That's the developers know about this. It's like going around the corner and puking. It's like the, <laughs> the wrong way. Like the real way would be this, and this is sort of going back way. Because it wants to output two things. It wants to output the tokens, but also the errors. You can only call this when you have a variable errors, so you have to initialize it even if you assign null to it, but it needs to be there, because otherwise ref wouldn't work. Once you call this, in this case, that's an interesting technique, by the way, I was wondering how can I create a function that gives me only specific tokens when the user submits the token kind, but if the user doesn't submit a token kind, how can I get all tokens? And it's not that trivial because this enumeration doesn't have a value for all. It only has values for specific tokens. If it had a value for all, I could say, if, if the user chose all, show all. But if you set a default parameter set name that doesn't exist, then that means if the user doesn't specify any parameter, you can pick that up. Question? I think you can use PS bound parameters. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that would be another way of doing that, PS bound parameters to see has the user submitted yes. something. Um, however, if you did that, you wouldn't pick up splatting, I think. And, um, and this one is really easy because all I do here is I'm asking the PS commanded variable, which parameter set did you actually pick? And if someone didn't submit any arguments, it's the default all, else it would be selected. Anyway, so what I'm doing here is now if I want to see all the tokens, then I give back all the tokens. It's very easy. If the user <coughs> wanted a specific token, it's simply a matter of piping into where object and then doing the sort or doing the filtering. So this is really a very, very easy function. And uh, get token is just as easy because it's just a different interface. Get token, that's a new interface with more detailed tokens. Here I have two different pieces of information, kind and flag. It's basically the same thing, but the call is different. Morning. <coughs> here it's a different interface, and this one is called parse input. You have two different methods here. You have parse input and, and parse file. Parse input would take string, parse file would take a file. And this time you get back two things, tokens and errors because in this case, this function returns three things. It returns the tokens, the errors, and also the AST. That was the new thing in PowerShell 3. In this case, I'm not interested in the ASTs. That's why I'm nulling it. I'm not storing it. I'm simply interested in the new tokens. And then it's the same game. If the user didn't specify a parameter, I return all the tokens. Else, if it's a flag, if you, if you specify the flag, I'm filtering on the flag else on the kind. And that way you can very easily get all the tokens uh, that you may need. Now, what about AST? Get AST. Get AST. AST basically inside is the same thing. 
it is again the same call. I'm parsing the inputs and getting the tokens and the errors. In this case, I'm not interested in the tokens. In this case, I want the AST, so I'm saving the AST on this side. And now, to really get something, we have a question. Yeah, I just wondered, um, both parsers have an error. Are they the same error types that come back, or are they different from the language parser as opposed to the PS parser? It's an excellent question. <laughs> I, I, I was going to check, but I didn't. I thought I'd just ask you. Yeah, that's good. Please check <laughs> and tell me. <laughs> uh, I, I'm because one came after the other, and so I would think I would hope that. The well, we we can basically be better. Yeah, you should check. Really, I didn't check. Um, I always take the information I get and say, "Okay, thanks for giving me that information." But I didn't really see yeah, if the I'll interfaces. They won't give you more detail. That's for sure. But but it may be organized in a different way. Um, so I get back the AST from my code, but the AST is really not that simple to, um, to really get. Because what you get is only the first node. AST abstract syntax tree is a tree. So it starts with, on the top with a script, script block. It's always a script block on the top, <coughs> whether you have a script or a code. It's always sort of the, the basic container in PowerShell is always a script block. And then you can traverse the tree to the, to the different AST structural elements. To do that, you have to take AST and call the find all methods. That's the secret here. The find all method finds you all the sub expressions and it has a weird way of calling it. You have to submit a script block and a bool bool uh, boolean parameter. The script block is a delegate. So the script block, in the simplest way, would just be true. I'm telling you in a second why it can be, a, why it should be a script block in the first place. So always say true here. In this one, it can be true or false. If you say true, it, the tree would go recursively to, to the leaf elements. If you say false, it'll simply output this, the, the AST elements on your scope level. So it's not going into sub-functions or nested <coughs> script blocks or something like that. If you say true here, you get all the AST elements. In fact, what you can do is, in the script block you have dollar $arcs, these are the um, anonymous arguments. <coughs> and $Args0, the first index element, uh, element in args, would be the actual AST element that is being retrieved for you. So here you could also have a condition where you say $Args0 equals uh, command expression or equals this or that. So you can pre-filter that. It's basically like, basically like a WMI filter. You can either filter server-side, that is uh, server-side filtering, or you can filter client-side then you're retrieving everything and then you're throwing away what you don't want. In this case, I chose simply to get all AST elements for simplicity. Do that depending on whether the, the user wanted recursive or not. And then sorting out the elements I don't want. Now the challenge is with AST, you need maximum control over which parts of your script you want to monitor. And have you, as you've seen in the previous example, one good way would be to first get an AST, let's say for a function, then you have the function scope, and then take that as a parent to find the detailed elements just in that function. So I needed a way of adding the parent, parent thing in, in, in this filter. So you get back all the AST elements, either if the user hasn't specified a parent, then you get them all, or if there was a, a parent, then this is my current AST. This is the location information. Then I only want ASTs where the start offset is greater than the parent, or greater or equal than the parent's start offset, and the end offset is smaller or equal the parent's end offset. So you really have that scope. That's the easiest way of doing that. There are other ways that don't work, so that works always. <clears throat> so if uh, AST type is equals all, that's how you get to the AST elements. And if you <coughs> chose a specific AST, then it's simply another filter. Where it's filtering... Oh, here. Here you can see the other script block delegate in action. This one would, would, would return everything. This one takes the current AST, checks the type of that AST, checks the name, and looks... If that name is like, they always start with, uh, they always have the required type that you submitted, like command, parameter, whatever, and then they always have an AST at the end. So that's a, a way of just getting the AST types that you want. 
Now, what can you do with these things? In the debug session yesterday, <coughs> I, I showed a couple of things. Uh, let's start with this one. Um, who has um, joined the debug session yesterday? Okay, some, some haven't. So in yesterday's session, I was focusing on um, debugging techniques. And I said that write debug is really a good thing to add to your script, not just because you can add notations and emit diagnostic data, but also you can have you, because you can create clever tools that enable and de uh, disable and turn these things to debugging breakpoints. So in this script here, oh, let's just do it like that. Here's a command called enable write debug breakpoints. When I call that, they all turn breakpoints. And again, when I do that, only the write debug statements that have a parameter of a both would be turned into breakpoints. So only these two. And uh, when I clear all breakpoints, I can also disable all the write debug statements in case I want to send that script to a, a customer and I don't want him to see that stuff. So now they are, question? Yeah, question, because uh, I've, I've seen the write debug has different behavior depending on if you use the common, common parameter or the preference uh, automatic variable. And if you use the common parameter minus debug, it seems to always be a breakpoint. I don't know if you noticed that too. Oh, okay. Yeah. How do you, so I see a disable, that'd be cool to disable because that was always Exactly. Minus for both minus debug and it breaks in your... That's code. exactly the point. Yeah, exactly that. When you have write debug statements in your script, th that's perfectly okay because they never output information in production environments. But the user who's working in production environments, when the user uses your function, like you said, he will always see the debug common parameter. And when, when, when he accidentally uses that, all these write debug statements turn into inquire, to, to simple breakpoints, and that's a great source of confusion. So that's why I came up in my uh, scenario here with this disable write debug, because that way they all are converted to comments. They're not uh, danger anymore to, uh, to the uh, fainted heart, and, but you can always enable them again if you want to. Now let's take a look at how these things work, because they use the AST now. Enable write debug breakpoints. Oh, let's start with, uh, yeah, let's start with enable write debug breakpoints. How can I turn all write debug statements into breakpoints? Okay, so basically, this is all blah blah, it's just the function. Here's the beef. So I'm taking my AST and I'm looking for commands, but only commands that have command elements. That's Sounds obvious, but it's not obvious. There are sometimes commands that have no command elements. I need command elements because the first command element should be write debug. This way I get from all my commands to just the write debug commands. And then for each of these write debug commands, I'm finding out the line number that this command is in. Remember, all the AST elements always have an extent. And the extent is simply a property filled with location information from start to end and so on. So I now know the line with all my write debug statements, and now it's just a matter of setting a breakpoint. But before I can set a breakpoint, I need to remove it first, because I don't want to have multiple breakpoints on, on the same line. So I'm here actually only checking whether this line in my current file has a breakpoint, and if it has a breakpoint, I'm simply removing that. And then, if uh, the user did not say discard, discard would be the option that the user can choose to remove all the breakpoints. I'm piping on my AST element. And now I'm checking whether or not the write debug statement has a verbose switch or not. So I'm looking for either the, the user said verbose only or uh, said did not say verbose only or if the user said verbose only, I'm looking into the command elements looking for a command parameter, looking for a command parameter that is called verbose and checking whether I have more than zero. So that way I know I have a write debug with at least a verbose command parameter. And then the rest is the same thing. Here I'm finally setting the breakpoint for all the lines that I detected. So fairly straightforward. And you can see that it's just an, an eye opener. You can refactor your scripts, do things to certain commands as you like doesn't have to be write debug and breakpoints. For example, 
enable and disable write debug would actually change your script. The, the previous script was simply setting breakpoints. Now I'm, I'm, I'm trying to refactor the script. I want to comment out all the write debug statements. Let's check that out. Uh, it's really simple, as you can see, just a couple lines of code. First of all, this was my effort this morning <laughs> to work around a little bug. Uh, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Um, <laughs> when you have breakpoints in your scripts, whenever you run a script, the debugger is invoked. And when the debugger is invoked, all scripts are read-only, so you can change them. So if you want to automatically change your scripts in the ISE, you may have to make sure that you have no breakpoint set. But this, for some reason, didn't work. I don't know why. Um, so you get, again, all commands that have command elements that are called write debug, so it's the same thing. And then this is very important. I need to sort these AST elements because, as you can imagine, if you have more than one write debug a statement, and when you start editing these, the moment you edit the first one, all the offsets to the other ones are gone. So you have to simply reverse the order and start from the bottom to top. So that way you don't change any offsets. So I'm sorting descending on start offset. Now I have them from bottom to top. And this is now a loop that simply goes and checks the line at the column where I am. And this is the rather limited way of the native ISE, how you can change things in your script, but it works. You can set the correct position to wherever you want, and then you can insert whatever you want. So I'm simply setting the correct position in front of each write debug and then add um, comments on. And as you can see, it works. So this would be disabling write debug. In this case, I needed to add a character to my script. And now let's see how the opposite works. What if I need to remove information? Because when I want to enable write debug, I need to extract the comment sign. It's basically the same thing, but a slight difference. It's down here. In this case, I set the correct position. I, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have even needed to do that. This is the important thing. I'm selecting existing text, and then I'm inserting nothing, effectively replacing the selection with nothing. So whenever you want to change code in your, in your IC editor, you really need to use select and then insert. That would be a replace. Okay, so if you take it from here, you can now create all kinds of sophisticated solutions. There's one thing that I um, created last year. Let's see, where is it? Solutions. That's uh, convert alias. Convert, convert alias would simply take a script where you write things like this, CN Windows and the GPS PowerShell or something like that. And now, as you can see, IC Steroids does the same thing too. It, it will tell you here, uh, don't use aliases. And then when you click here, you get the uh, real stuff. But basically, it's using the same core technology that you now have seen. So you could change that yourself simply by running, what is it called? Convert alias. Convert alias. So that worked too. Let's check out how get, uh, convert alias looks like. And you'll see that it's always the same principle here. Um, in this case, I first need my aliases. I need to know what alias do I have. And this is a very clever way, I think, in PowerShell, how you can look up things. Who of you has worked with group object as hash table? OK, that is something I need to show to you, because that's really, really, really useful. Um, if I wanted to look up aliases, I could get the list of aliases and then use a where object to find out the right alias or something like that. With group object, it's much easier. If I take all my aliases and I group them, I would get something like this. I would get piles of aliases. Each pile is one because they're all different in name, and that wouldn't help me much. However, if I store this and say get alias group object uh, group yeah, object as hash table as string, they always go together. Always take them both. Don't miss as string. Then I have a hash table, and I can have a, I can simply look up the elements in the hash table. So I can say alias dir. That's this, or alias uh, GPS. That's this. So it's really, really easy. 
you can use that easily to look up error codes and try, uh, and, and uh, translate them to meaningful text like that. Or I could do th things like s equals get service group object property status as hash table as string. So now I can say as running and get all my running services or as stopped and get all my stopped services. So that's really useful. And here in this case, I'm using that to resolve the aliases. Here are my aliases as a hash table. And I'm simply using the old technique. That's why I brought it to you too. Get token old, the old interface, isn't obsolete. It's sometimes the best way of doing things because it's fairly simple. Get token old, I'm using get token old to find all the commands. And then I'm sorting them again in reverse order. And then I'm checking whether the command name contains is contained in my alias lookup. So if I find it in my alias lookup, I know the command is an alias. And then I go into my alias. That That's all aliases. That's my command that I found. So this is the alias uh, that I'm having there. And the real name is found in that alias. It always has a property called resolve command name that gives me the target, the real target of it. So the rest, you know, select the old extent, replace it with a new name, and off you go. And in the same way, you could, if you wanted to, also write obfuscators if you wanted to protect your script code for some reason and don't want to uh, yeah, give your secret, pass your secrets to others, then um, there is one sample script, convert to obfuscated script. This one is dangerous. Uh, don't use it if you get the sample code. Don't use it on your production scripts. It's simply a brain teaser showing you what you can do. So um, I'm showing you why it's dangerous. Here is the WMI Explorer from Mao. Does anyone know that? Yeah, yeah it's a classic, huh? 2006. Um, and when you run this here, you'll see one of the, its limitations in this original form would be it's very small. It's not really scaling well on high resolutions anymore because it's a WinForm thing, and he never updated that. But it's running, so if I connect, I'm connected, and all that is fine. And now I'm trying to obfuscate this. So I'm saying uh, convert to obfuscated script. And I'm scrolling down a little bit so you see what's happening. OK, it's now running. And you see what's going on. The text turns black because now every variable is uh, replaced by a GUID. And since it is a stupid interface, I'm using this very limited PSISE stupid text interface, PowerShell is always trying to retokenize the script after each change, which is why it stops now and now it takes a while till uh, the ISE got after it and uh, then eventually it'll continue to do the, um, to do the uh, renaming process. It would be much faster if you do it in a external text file. You could do the same thing because the interface uh, accepts raw code too. But now you can see what happens. Each variable has been replaced by um, just an unreadable GUID. Yeah, I'm just thinking about this. Have you ever tried to just, uh, instead of modifying in the editor or the text, to modify the actual uh, base AST object and then that doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah, the question is, can, can you actually change the AST object um, in to change your code? That would be wonderful because that way you would have a very structured way of getting into your code and make changes and and leave it to the AST to apply the changes. But the AST is only a one-way road. Read it's read only. Properties. It's simply a, yeah a snapshot of the current script state, and if you change the AST, the script doesn't care. Unfortunately, there's no way of really. No, there's no save, save AST. There's no save AST, right? If you wanted to do that, that's a different topic. That would be the topic of AST visitors. With a visitor, you can hook up your own custom code inside the AST and have it. Oh, it's a different thing. But now you see here, every variables have um, a random name now, and if I run this, it'll still run. Which is luck, <laughs> because that's the reason why I said it's dangerous. All this thing did was look for variable tokens, see if that variable was known already. If it wasn't, assign it to a hash table and assign it to GUID, and then do the replacement. Now, the challenge with refactoring things like this is always just assume you have a situation like this. A function with a parameter block with parameters, 
Okay, parameter. Two parameters and um, you're using that one parameter here, parameter one. We just need one. And we're calling the function two. Test parameter one, hello. So if I run this, it would run. And it's just put one more variable up here. If you do a token replace, it's more or less like a search and replace. It's a little bit better than search and replace because you know specifically that the token is the token. It's not in a, inside a comment or something. But it is just the token. It's not in, in structure of your script. Here, if you take a look at that script, you have two different parameter variables. This is in a different scope than this. So if you do a rename on parameter one, it shouldn't change this. If you rename this, it shouldn't change this. But even worse, if you change this, you would have to also change the parameter here. So there are, there are dependencies on variables in PowerShell. So if you, if you simply obfuscate this, then you would obfuscate the variable, but not the parameter. That's one of the challenges that you have to keep in mind once you start refactoring things, which is why this took really long time when you press F2 here, that it really is scope correct, and that is simply um, renaming the right, right places. Um, so you won't, you don't want to do that just by a brute force approach with tokenization. So there, there are two interfaces. There's the old PowerShell version two interface with the token get token old, and then there's a new one, and the new one also gives you the AST. They're all objects. You can always look at these objects, uh, pipe them to out grid, grid view, for example, and uh, I guess because we started a little bit early, I am already done. Well, that's a question. Uh, that's no, good. I can just add that there are different error. The token errors are different, and the AST is much more rich. So good. Okay, thank you. So if you want to have detailed errors, let's check out one more thing. Maybe I want one more more thing here. Find error in script. That would be a little function that you can use as a pipeline filter to find all scripts in your repository that have syntax errors. And let's check out how that works. I have one parameter. Value from pipeline, it's ex uh, accepting a file info, so a file. I have a process block here because it is supposed to be a pipeline enabled function. So this would be my loop that is looped for every incoming file info. For security reasons, I'm simply checking whether the file has an extension PS1 because I don't want to parse uh, binaries or some, something like that. And here I'm simply getting the content from that file. Always make sure you use raw. Raw is new in PowerShell 3 because that gives you the entire text content. If you don't say raw, you always get a string array, line by line. You could also say like ps star 1 and you would get your modules. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, good, good suggestion. Even better like that. Yeah. In line. Sure. Yeah. Good suggestion. And then here is the function get error. Get error takes some script code and returns the error information. And if there is no error information, I or if there is an error information, if it's greater than the zero, I'm simply returning the object. Let's first see that in action and then take a look at get get error. The question mark means one character, so you'd be a star there, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, it's question mark. Zero. Yeah, so yeah, because you need a start. Uh, oh yeah, you're start. absolutely right. So your yours was the better approach. <laughs> well. All right. And uh, so now this would r run my, my filter, and you see here is an error. That's that's a script. That's a script. That's a script. They all have syntax errors. And I simply ran it by saying dir into any document folder I have, recurse, and pipe it to test syntax error. And test syntax error by itself. Looks like that. It is no get error. I wanted to check out. That's what it looks like. And as you can see here, I'm, I was using the old interface. So when you say the new interface gives me even more syntax error information, I might even explore the new interface. It doesn't matter which one you take. At the end, you get errors back. In this case, I just want to know if I have errors at all. Um, and then if there are errors, I'm simply adding a member, I'm adding, adding a me the message, the error message, which, which would originally be a sub-property of that 
that element. So if I wanted to find out more information about the errors, that's the reason why I can do things like hello get error and see the message up here too. Okay, any questions? Uh, that's Dave I'm just thinking how this could be combined with Kester so that you could actually do part of your validation yes. that the script doesn't, for example, contain aliases in a field. So. Yes, it's, a, it's an excellent thing. Um, you, of course, you can combine it. And, and when you take a look at the script analyzer, which is this community project, that largely depends on that too. Mm -hmm. So it is actually using all of these tokens and AST things to uh, write the rules. Yeah, I'm always... So, this might be a personal problem. <laughs> but um, I use this to um, write a script to detect in a very large module um, um, commandlets or functions that didn't use approved verbs. Yes. Um, and that worked really well. But when I tried to get inside comments to parse comment based help, so I used the um, parser um, and then I used its get help content method. Um, and I couldn't then get inside the comment block. I had to just use straight parsing. Is there another way to do that? Once you're inside the comment help block, so what I was trying to do was look for misnamed mm -hmm. comment keywords. Yes. Is, is there a trick for this? It's a very good question. And the, the problem is that comments don't exist in the AST scope. The AST is about running code, and comments are ignored by the engine normally. Right. So when you get the AST for a function, you do have a reference to the, the comment token or extend, so you know where the, where the comment is. Right. But the comment structure inside is simply a string operation. There's nothing you can do. The AST is ignoring that. Uh, yeah, okay. But it does have the get help content method for the function definition in the AST class. We can, we can so on the, on the, OK, so, okay I'm gonna, just to I'll plug here, if I'm going to do something on script analyzer. I'm new to this, but I've, I've played around with the last two days. and. And so I actually found there is, in the AST, on the root of the AST, there's a, com a comment. And that breaks it down to all the keywords in the comment. So you do... Uh, Let's a, check uh, it out. Yeah, Let's just do a little it, test. Yeah, get it, yeah. Well, so I have to actually, probably do it differently. It's something that you go by because it's not in the find all. It's actually on the root of the, uh, the script block AST. Let's, Let's check it out. So if I have a comment-based help here, let's say a synopsis. Just use snippets, I, that's what I do. Yeah, oh yeah, that's right. <laughs> Test function. Do I have one with help? Or does <laughs> I didn't find the right so so let's just let's Sorry. just do it this way. So which snippet are you using? The complete or the advanced or the advanced either have comments. So oh well, that's good. I could have used that one too. Okay, now um Let's uh, see what I get back. When I say here, AST equals get AST. I want all AST elements, but I only want the first. Select object first one, the top element. So AST now is this. So which would be the... So if you do GM on, it, on AST, you'll see that there's a command, uh, something, a comment. Yeah, a get comment help form. comment. Uh, get, or is it get comment? Yeah, get help comment. Okay, what does it want for me? It wants for me nothing. Okay. Is that expected? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I Well I get a different structure with it shows you every every it, keyword it has a, a place and then you can break into every keyword. So you have Porsche six on there. Damn. <laughs> 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 Yeah, we can take a look at that later on outside. Yeah, I can That's show you my code as well. It's really very simple. But, but, but once, so I'm getting the entire block, but I'm not able yes. to get any more definition. The problem than, than is that the parsing of, of the uh, of the um, comment based help is a different set of API functions inside of PowerShell. Right. You could use reflection to use those and then feed in the raw data and have it processed. But that is really easy. Uh, so it's almost easier just to do to do a regular expression or something. Straight parsing. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. Thank you. But but we we'll look at that. Maybe there is something that we all haven't seen. <laughs> yeah. well, but it, because it would be great somewhere. to get syntax yeah. errors. It's always good to have new eyes to look on that stuff. Okay. More questions. Okay. Then um, 
I hope you... Oh, there's one. Can you create your own token types? No. <laughs> that was easy. Good <laughs> <laughs> you have to okay, then uh, thanks for your time and uh, have a great day today. Thank you. It's still blinking.